This episode contains descriptions of violence and sexual assault that may be triggering or difficult for some listeners. As always, we'll try to cover it in a way that's honest, but not gratuitous. However, if you want to avoid this kind of content, consider sitting this one out. Welcome to Crime and Sacrifice. My name is Brianna, and this is episode 14, Joseph Naso. On April 13, 2010, parole officer Wes Jackson was on his way to make a routine but surprise home visit to one of his parolees, a man named Joseph Naso, who lived in Reno, Nevada. Joe was a weird old guy, 76 years old at the time, and with a string of bizarre but mostly petty crimes on his rap sheet, mainly shoplifting convictions. In fact, it was because of a shoplifting charge at a grocery store that Joseph was currently on parole. He hadn't served any time for the conviction, possibly because the judge felt bad given his old age. But Naso had made a habit of these seemingly unnecessary shoplifting charges, including one where he had tried to walk off with 30 pairs of women's lingerie from a department store. Whether he was a kleptomaniac or just some kind of social misfit with some weird fetish didn't matter. What did matter was that unannounced home visits were a condition of Naso's parole. And it was Jackson's job to see the matter through. When Wes arrived at Joseph's residence, he could tell that Naso was clearly not happy to see him, but he let Wes in, and the parole officer began looking around. He noted that Joseph's adult son, Charles, was living with him at the time, a mentally unstable man with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Wes was disturbed at the condition of the place, with garbage and refuse everywhere, old food left out and rotting on the kitchen countertops. Of course, being a hoarder didn't violate Joseph's parole. But then Wes saw it. Bullets hastily concealed in an ashtray alongside a nearby advertisement for guns and ammunition. Joseph tried to talk it off. It was a clear violation of Joseph's parole to have bullets or guns, and anyway, Naso seemed generally uncooperative and evasive. The doors were locked for a couple of the bedrooms, and Naso simply refused to unlock them. That was enough for Wes. He called in backup as police took Naso into custody and they began to do a more thorough search of his property. Upon gaining access to the bedroom doors that had been locked, police were alarmed at what they found. The first thing they noticed were the many mannequin parts strewn all over the place. Legs dressed in fishnet stockings and high-heeled shoes, and even a full female mannequin wearing a red dress. Women's lingerie was also scattered all over the place and they found more mannequin parts by the literal suitcase scattered around the house and garage. Though disturbing and unsettling, this was not what made police realize that they might have somebody genuinely dangerous on their hands. Instead, it was the photographs of women everywhere, over 4,000 pictures in total. But it wasn't just the sheer number of women and girls but the fact that the subjects were in various stages of undress or tied up in some way. And while some of the photographs appeared to be consensual, many of them did not. In some, it looked as if the women were unconscious. And in others, the most disturbing of the photographs, it looked like the subjects were dead, the skin discolored in a way that suggests decay. Investigators had no idea what they had walked into, but they knew that they needed to make sure that Naso stayed in jail until they had a chance to go through this wealth of evidence. Luckily, in addition to the bullets found in the ashtray, they also found more clear violations of his parole, including a container filled with weapons behind a refrigerator in his garage, with knives and various firearms. With Naso's parole violation clear, 
the authorities were able to secure a year-long jail sentence that allowed them to go through all of the evidence they found at Naso's residence. The closer they looked, the more disturbing things got. In addition to some innocuous but strange findings, including more than $150,000 in cash, out of place given the squalor and modesty of the apartment that Naso was living in, police also soon discovered a handwritten diary from Naso that seemed to document an entire lifetime of sexual assault and coercion. The journal hadn't been kept at the time, but was more like an aging Naso had been reminiscing about sexual assaults that he had engaged in throughout the course of his life, as early as when he was 16 years old in the 1950s, almost 60 years earlier. Here is a sampling of the kinds of sick things that Naso wrote. Rochester, Italian girl, dark hair, long nose, buck teeth. She wore a girdle, nylons, cried. She was 17. I was 16. Girl in North Buffalo Woods. She was real pretty. Front seat of my car. Had to knock her out first. 1958. In another entry that Joseph claims took place in London. Outside the front door, I overpowered her and ravaged her. I couldn't help myself. Some of the entries seemed like more benign descriptions of sexual conquest, though honestly it's still hard to tell. Here's one example. 1961, Oakland. Cute young girl I picked up downtown Oak. Took her to a hotel. We had some good sex. It was a one-timer. Never saw her again. Very sweet. Very young. Very nice piece. However, a large portion of the entries described explicit rape, a pattern of stalking women, offering to give them a ride, and then assaulting them against their will in his car. The number of entries that police considered potential sexual assault or rape numbered over 100. Besides this journal, police also found a handwritten note that listed 10 women along with 10 locations. Here is what was scrawled in Naso's handwriting. Number one. Girl near Heldsburg, Mendocino County. Number two. Girl near Porta Costa. Number three. Girl near Lagunitas. In this one, there seems to be a misspelling for Lagunitas. Number four. Girl on Mount Tam. Number five. Girl from Miami, near Down Peninsula. Number six, girl from Berkeley. Number seven, lady from 839 Leavenworth. Number eight, girl in Woodland, near Nevada County. Number nine, girl from Linda, Yuba County. Number 10, girl from MRSV, Cemetery. Of course, the list could have been something innocuous, or maybe it could have been additional rapes. But police had an especially ominous feeling about it, that it could represent something even more cryptic. Given the things that Naso seemed capable of based on his diary, it wasn't a stretch to imagine him graduating to murder. This, combined with all of the other disturbing things they found in the apartment, left police determined to identify who the women were in the photographs, in the diary, and on Naso's list. They set to work sharing crucial evidence with other departments in the listed areas to see if it lined up with any unsolved crimes. Simultaneously, they began digging into Naso's past and criminal record to get a sense of who this guy was and just what he might have been capable of and what he might have done. Joseph Naso was born in Rochester, New York, on January 7, 1934, and appears to have lived what seemed like an unremarkable childhood. During the 1950s, he served in the United States Air Force, during which time he began dating a woman named Judith. They soon married and had a son together, Upon Joseph being discharged from service, 
The family eventually moved to the West Coast and settled in the Bay Area near San Francisco. Joseph developed an interest in photography and began taking classes at several local colleges. He eventually purchased the necessary equipment and began offering photography sessions for weddings and personal portraits. For a while, he would even go door to door selling these photography services. Though police had found mostly petty convictions on his official record, shoplifting charges and thefts, they did discover a couple of disturbing incidents that, although Joseph was never formally charged with a crime, he was found to have sexually assaulted a young woman. In both instances, Joseph was picked up but basically just given a slap on the wrist, authorities telling him to get out of town but never charging him with a crime. The first was in 1958 in the Rochester and Buffalo area. In the second instance, in Berkeley, California, around 1961, Joseph had met a young woman at a dance. The two seemed to be getting along well, and he offered her a ride home, the young woman accepting. Once he got her into his car, Joseph tried to shove some kind of drug or sedative down her throat and proceeded to rape her. She reported it to authorities, but again, basically the same thing happened. Police picked Joseph up and told him to leave town once again, and Joseph was happy to comply, or at least appeared to comply. And that was it in terms of his violent crime that had been reported. But it was clear that whatever was bubbling under the surface for Naso was leading directly to unhappiness within his family. Adding to other difficulties in his marriage, their son Charles was also suffering from mental disorders that ultimately developed into schizophrenia. Things between Judith and Joseph became particularly rocky as Charles got older, and after 18 years of marriage, the pair ultimately divorced. Both still lived in the Bay Area for a while after that. And despite how things had ended, Joseph would still visit Judith regularly, though in later interviews, a friend of hers mentioned that Joseph always seemed odd to her at the time, that he had a strange demeanor, unwilling or unable to look her in the eye when they spoke. With his freelance photography work to keep him busy, Joe soon became something of a nomad starting in the 1970s, which lasted for many years as he traveled around the country and even overseas at times, often visiting western New York and staying with relatives in the Rochester area. But Joseph's main address remained on the West Coast, and he picked up additional work as a property manager at several of the places he lived. He eventually lived in Piedmont, California for a time, then moved to Sacramento, before finally winding up in Reno, Nevada. This is where he was living when parole officer Wes Jackson paid him an unannounced visit. As police began to question neighbors and those that knew Joseph through the years, it became clear that he wasn't one of those people that neighbors seemed shocked to hear that he was suspected of violent crimes. Instead, many of the people who knew Joseph through the decades remembered him as an unpleasant man, prone to excessive drinking and a raging temper that earned him the moniker of Crazy Joe from one couple that lived in the same San Francisco apartment building as him in the 1980s. Their names were Margaret or Maggie Prisco and Thaddeus Arizo, and they had had a number of disturbing experiences with Joseph. He had always seemed sullen, refusing to say hello or make any of the normal pleasantries, and just gave off a creepy vibe that Thaddeus even described as pure evil in a later interview with the San Francisco Chronicle. In one particular instance, Thaddeus, who lived with Maggie upstairs from Joseph at the time, recalled how a drunk and belligerent Joseph ran outside in his underwear screaming with a tequila bottle in hand demanding that Thaddeus stop playing the guitar that day. When Thaddeus refused, he was young at the time and thought he could take Joseph if it came down to it, had a Louisville slugger baseball bat nearby. 
Joseph began yelling threats, saying over and over again that he would kill Thaddeus. In another instance, Thaddeus was taking out the trash one day when he noticed Joseph coming from the direction of the apartment garbage area. As he passed, he told Thaddeus that the things in the garbage weren't his. This piqued Thaddeus' interest, but when he looked to see what Joe had been talking about, he noticed a stack of gross pornography, pictures of women tied up, and some images looking as though they were being tortured. It made his stomach turn, and from then on, Maggie and Thaddeus did their best to steer clear of Naso. It wasn't until years later that they would discover that Maggie may have been a direct target of Naso's, written about in graphic detail in one of his diaries, the sick torture that he had wanted to put her through, though thankfully nothing ever came of it, and they eventually moved away and moved on with their lives. As for Naso, he eventually moved away as well, though his exact movements in the next decade are unclear. It appears that he may have had a few girlfriends throughout the years, but that otherwise he was continuing his photography work and property management. He also continued caring off and on for his adult son, Charles, who lived alternately in hospitals, group homes, and with Joseph throughout the years. Charles was, if not a bright spot in Joe's life, at least somebody that the older Naso appeared to actually care about. It was a difficult relationship, with Charles becoming violent at times, and Joseph even had to take out a restraining order against him in 1996. But despite these difficulties, he never gave up on his son, struggling with state agencies to retain guardianship over Charles. The state of Nevada believed that Charles should be in a group home for people with mental difficulties, and also claimed that Joseph wasn't the best caretaker, that he would give Charles alcohol, and wasn't strict about making sure that Charles took his medication as prescribed, thus making Charles' condition worse. But Joseph believed that his son should be with him, and fought desperately to make sure that he was. According to the Associated Press, Joseph wrote the following in one such court battle, this time with the Social Security Administration. Quote, I have no social life. I do not indulge myself or seek pleasures. My mission in life, my time, and much of my expense revolves around trying to provide care and welfare for my son. While it could be argued that Joseph was just trying to retain guardianship in order to reap the financial rewards of being Charles' caretaker, there were some acquaintances that knew both of them and believed that Joseph's love for his son was genuine. This included Roberta Fletcher, who ran a local organization for the mentally ill, and who spoke to news outlets about seeing Joseph's care for his son firsthand. She was one of the few people to express shock that Naso was now the suspect for some very heinous crimes. In 1998, at the age of 64, Joseph began a relationship with an older woman, 75 years old at the time, named Mildred Gardner. She was also wealthy, which appears like it might have been a big motivator in Joseph pursuing her. The two of them had met at a local senior center, and at first things were good. Joseph seemed genuinely happy to have her in his life. And Mildred was happy with the arrangement for a while, Joseph telling her that he wanted to get married. But eventually things soured, as they did with every romantic relationship that Joseph had in his life. It was only gradually that Mildred uncovered Joseph's horrendous temper, his propensity to yell at her, berate her, and even try to take some of her property including a small revolver, scaring Mildred even more. With his shift in behavior, she also discovered that he was trying to take control of her finances. Mildred eventually shared her suspicions about Joseph with other family members, who were extremely alarmed and helped her hire a private investigator to research Joseph. It was then that she discovered his previous crimes, mostly small thefts, but things that he had kept from her and which attested to his character 
to the fact that his greatest interest seemed to be in her finances. Perhaps the most embarrassing moment in the relationship for Mildred was when Joseph asked to photograph her in a compromising position. He wanted her to pose for him. She didn't want to, and it wasn't the kind of thing she had ever done before. But Mildred had trusted Joseph and wanted to make him happy, so she complied. Of course, Joseph betrayed that trust, eventually showing the photograph to one of the employees at the senior center where they had met, who was alarmed and disgusted, saying in a later interview that he believed that Joseph must have coerced her. Needless to say, their relationship was over for good, and Joseph was no longer welcome back at the senior center where they had met. Mildred eventually gathered the strength for a restraining order against Joseph, and also took him to court for the money that he had stolen from her. Mildred claimed that she had given Joseph $10,000 on one occasion, and $7,000 on another, so that he could buy them both a van and a house, one that was closer to the hospital where his son Charles was being treated at the time. Mildred claimed that Joseph took the money and indeed purchased the van and home, but that he had been deceitful, lying to her and putting only his name on the titles instead of both of their names, as they'd agreed. In the intervening years, the first decades of the 2000s, it seemed that Joseph's life was fairly quiet, besides his occasional bust for shoplifting or theft. Joseph eventually moved to Reno, and gained guardianship of Charles, a responsibility he seemed pleased to have. At least, that was all that authorities could find on paper for Joseph. But how a sexual predator could have avoided prosecution for over 60 years baffled them, and they were determined to get some kind of charges that would stick before Joseph was released from his year-long jail sentence for probation violation. And despite the lack of formal convictions or serious crimes on his record, they knew that they were closing in on building a case against him and intended to prove that Naso was not only a rapist and sexual predator, but also a serial murderer. After some initial digging, there were several unsolved murders that seemed to line up with Naso's list of ten women and locations. The most damning evidence pinning him to the cases was, of course, this handwritten note, but also evidence that he had seen fit to store in a safety deposit box that police were able to access with a warrant. Inside, they found photos that Naso had taken of two women. The first woman appeared to initially be posing for Naso, but the pictures eventually evolved to images where she appeared to be either unconscious or dead. The photos were attached to a newspaper article that Naso had cut out and preserved regarding the murder of a woman named Pamela Parsons. As investigators dug back into the case, they realized that it had gone cold and also recognized that the woman in the photographs was most likely Pamela herself. This was confirmed by one of her daughters, identifying both her mother and a distinctive fur coat in one of the photos that her mother had owned. Pamela Ruth Parsons had been a 38-year-old waitress when she was murdered, her brutalized body found in Yuba County in 1993. She had marks on her neck and wrists that were consistent with having been tied up before death, the cause of death most likely strangulation. There had been few leads in the case, though investigators did believe that Pamela may have turned tricks on the side to make some extra money, which many police officers recognize as high-risk behavior when it comes to potentially being the target of violence. When investigators compared her case to where Joseph had been living at the time, they recognized that he lived and worked near the restaurant where Pamela was waitressing in 1993 soon pairing her murder with number nine on Naso's list, girl from Yuba County, and confirming their worst suspicions, that what they were looking at was likely a list of women that Naso had murdered. In his safety deposit box, 
They also found enough evidence to link Naso definitively to another murder, this time of a woman named Tracy Tafoya. Again, they found photos of Tracy, culminating in a photo where she appeared to be dead, with newspaper clippings about the crime. Tracy had been 31 years old at the time of her death in 1994, a mother and wife who had fallen into a difficult addiction that led her into a cycle of sex work. She had been found drugged, raped, and ultimately strangled, a strategy that coincided with one of Naso's tactics of drugging women found in his rape diary. Her body had also been found in Yuba County, though she was found alongside a cemetery, lining up with number 10 on Naso's list, girl from MRSV Cemetery. Tracy had been found in the Marysville Cemetery. That was two murders that appeared to be definitively linked to Joseph Naso. Soon, with the help of other departments, investigators were able to link him to two additional murders. The first was of a woman named Roxine Rogash, who had been killed decades before the other two women, in 1977. She was only 18 years old at the time of her death, with a 5-foot, 2-inch stature, red hair, and freckles. Though Roxine's family has always strongly denied that she was involved in the sex trade in any way, some investigators did believe that she may have engaged in some sex work prior to her murder. Like Naso's other victims, Roxine was found in a rural area, alongside a road near Fairfax, California. She was discovered by a commuter whose car had broken down nearby, who found her lifeless body face down, naked, and partially concealed under some foliage. She was discovered on January 10th of that year. When police arrived on scene, they discovered pantyhose still wrapped around her neck and mouth, and a ball of pantyhose crumpled in her mouth. The cause of death was strangulation, and her feet were still bound together. They determined that her body had not been there for very long, that she had been dead for less than a day. At the time, police had worked the angle that Roxine had been murdered by one of the pimps in the area. There had been reports of an aggressive pimp who had assaulted another sex worker who also claimed to have worked with Rogash. And so police narrowed in on this man as their possible murderer, though nothing ever came of their investigation. For police working on the Naso case, they realized that Roxine could be number three on Naso's list, the girl from Lagunitas, again with his spelling error. Lagunitas, California, was only about a ten-minute drive from where Roxine was found. Crucially, Investigators were able to uncover preserved DNA evidence from the stockings around Roxine's neck and from the pair that she was wearing. Upon testing the evidence, they found two different DNA profiles. The stockings that she was wearing contained traces of Joseph Naso's DNA, while the stockings around her neck had DNA that matched Judith, Joseph Naso's ex-wife though the two of them had been married at the time of Roxine's death. Judith was cooperating with investigators, and it appeared that Joseph must have stolen her stockings in order to help him commit this crime. Finally, the fourth murder that they were preparing to charge Joseph Naso with was that for a woman named Carmen Cologne. Carmen was a 22-year-old woman at the time of her death in 1978, her naked body having been pushed down the side of a ravine, raped and strangled, like Joseph's other victims. She had been found by a highway patrolman in Porta Costa on August 13th, only about 30 miles from where Roxine's body was found. Police at the time knew that Carmen was a sex worker, which may have contributed to the lack of energy that was ultimately put into her case, which grew cold almost immediately. A sister of hers told police at the time that Carmen had been going to have her pictures taken before she disappeared, which, of course, lines up with Joseph's profession and his M.O. And the location of her body 
matched number two on Naso's list, the girl near Porta Costa. But the thing that definitively tied this murder to Naso was again DNA evidence. This time found from skin collected from underneath Carmen's fingernails that of course matched Joseph Naso. As investigators considered these four victims of Naso, they noticed one additional similarity between the women, that all four had the same initial for their first name as they did for their last. For those of you who listened to the Alphabet Killer episode two weeks ago, this should be ringing alarm bells. The Alphabet Killings took place in Rochester, New York, where three girls between the ages of 10 and 11 were sexually assaulted and murdered. Just as with these four victims, the three girls in Rochester had the same first and last initial, leading the public and some investigators to speculate that this may have been how the killer was targeting the girls. Even stranger and more disturbing is the fact that one of Naso's victims in California even had the exact first and last name as one of the murdered girls in Rochester, another Carmen Cologne. Maybe the most incriminating thing is that Joseph was back living temporarily with family in Rochester, New York in the early 1970s, at the time of the alphabet killings there, and was originally from the city as well. And investigators in Rochester went to work trying to see if their alphabet killer might finally have been caught. But as mentioned in our episode on the case, Though police in Rochester were at first very encouraged in believing that they had finally found the killer, Naso's DNA was eventually tested against the DNA found on Wanda Wachowicz's body, one of the girls, and Naso's DNA did not match, thus making it unlikely that he was the killer of any of the girls in Rochester. This is also supported by the fact that Naso seemed to have a different preference in victim that he mostly killed young, but adult women, whereas the alphabet killer in Rochester killed only girls 10 or 11 years old. Regardless, Marin County prosecutors now had enough to charge Joseph Naso with these four murders on the West Coast. Investigators had also been able to identify two other likely victims from Naso's list, though prosecutors didn't feel like they had enough evidence in these crimes to charge Naso formally. Nevertheless, the judge allowed them to bring these crimes into evidence during the trial to demonstrate Naso's behavior and the threat he posed to society. Note that neither of these additional victims have the same first and last initial, showing that Joseph Naso probably wasn't that particular, that he would still kill if the opportunity presented itself. The first additional suspected victim was a woman named Sharia Patton. Unlike the other women that Joseph killed, Sharia was not known to be a sex worker and was also much older than most of Joseph's victims, 56 at the time of her death in 1981. Her body was found along the beach near a Navy depot, apparently having washed ashore. She had been strangled and placed inside two garbage bags. Sharia lived in the San Francisco Bay Area and had been looking for work at the time of her death. Investigators learned that she was actually living in a property managed by Joseph at the time of her death, a property with an address of 839 Leavenworth. This coincided with number seven on Joseph's list, the lady from 839 Leavenworth. Joseph had even been a suspect in her murder at the time, with investigators discovering that he had photographed Sharia. However, they never had enough evidence to formally charge him with that crime, though at least now the case would be discussed in court. Note that Sharia was older than Naso at the time of her death, and she is the only one on the list that is referred to as lady rather than girl. The final murder that they were able to definitively tie to Joseph Naso was that of a woman who went by Sarah Dillon. Sarah had been born Renee Shapiro, but had developed an intense obsession with singer-songwriter Bob Dylan, and subsequently changed her name to that of Dylan's first wife, 
Like Sharia, Sarah was not known to be either an addict, at least of controlled substances, or a sex worker. However, she was such a huge fan that she devoted much of her life to Bob Dylan and his concerts, traveling across the country and even overseas to make it to every show she could. And she was known to Bob Dylan's manager and, of course, his security team, too. Sarah had disappeared in 1992, well on the way to one of his concerts that took place at the Warfield Theater in San Francisco. When she didn't show up, Another diehard fan was so surprised that he called her family to let them know that she hadn't made it to the show. Sarah's family was concerned, but not panicked at the news. After all, Sarah had a tendency to travel and disappear for long stretches. But as years passed without any contact with her family, they began to suspect that something awful had happened to her, but never had any closure with her disappearance until investigators first popped open Joseph Naso's safety deposit box. Inside, along with the evidence for Pamela and Tracy's murders, investigators also discovered personal items that appeared to belong to Sarah Dillon, including her ID with her given name of Renee Shapiro and some of her business cards. They linked her death to number eight on Naso's list, Girl in Woodland, near Nevada County. Soon, they were able to pair Sarah's disappearance to that general area and to a skull that had been found years earlier by a logger. It was ultimately proven to be Sarah, and finally her family had some degree of closure and some idea of what had happened to Sarah. As for the other four women and locations on the list, investigators struggled to link them to any cold cases prior to taking Naso to trial but decided to proceed with the evidence they had, six murders, four that he was formally charged with, spanning from 1977 to 1994, when Joseph was roughly 43 to 60 years old. And it was just in time, as Naso was scheduled to be released from his jail sentence for violating his parole. Almost a year to the day from when he was first arrested, the district attorney charged him with the murders of Roxine Rogash, Carmen Colon, Pamela Parsons, and Tracy Tafoya. With so much evidence mounted against him, things were looking promising for the prosecutors Dory Ahana and Rosemary Sloat as Naso first appeared in court for these crimes on April 13, 2011. Joseph Naso, for his part, claimed to be innocent, that he was being set up, and he ultimately pled not guilty. The court discovered that Joseph had about a million dollars in net worth, and yet he didn't want to pay for an attorney. Because it was clear that he could afford it, the court refused to appoint one for him, and this tightness with money appears to have been another aspect of Joseph's personality, a desire to hold on to his money, even potentially at the cost of his own freedom. And it's also interesting to recall that Joseph had many recent instances of shoplifting where he was caught, and probably countless others where he wasn't, despite the fact that he was quite wealthy. It was this cheapness, plus an overall arrogance, that led Joseph to want to represent himself in this case. Judge Andrew Sweet tried to dissuade Naso, said that it was a bad idea and that if he wanted the best chance in this case, he should get a lawyer. But Naso refused, saying that he had done well in civil cases in the past. Eventually the judge gave in. Prosecutors Ahana and Sloat were silent, though I like to imagine that they were probably secretly very happy at this particular turn of events. And so the case began before a jury of six men and six women in Marin County. Prosecutors got to work presenting the trove of evidence they had uncovered during their investigation, much of which we've already spoken about. It's hard to decide what piece of evidence was most damning, though certainly the DNA and photos of confirmed victims was up there. But it was now 2011. Even the most recent of the murders had been almost 20 years prior 
and the earliest more than 30 years before. In cases that have been cold for this long, it is notoriously hard to convict, and Ahana and Sloat were taking no chances. Joseph's tactic seemed to be to play the part of the completely innocent man being railroaded, and he always showed up to court well-dressed, was always sure to smile in the direction of the jurors, assuring them that this was all a mistake, that he was only being prosecuted because the authorities took issue with his lifestyle. Joseph acknowledged that he had taken the photos, that he had a fascination with what he called cheesecake photos of women, and he admitted that yes, he did hire sex workers for some of his photography, but that everything was consensual. As to the most disturbing photos, particularly the ones where women looked dead or unconscious, he claimed that it was all just artwork and that all of his models had consented happily. When it came to the DNA evidence and his journal of apparent sexual assaults, his defense was less convincing, and he claimed that the evidence could have been planted and that he was merely exaggerating with his writing. As the trial continued, prosecutors introduced additional evidence, including Naso's meticulous calendars that dated back decades. They were able to find entries for the days that both Pamela Parsons and Tracy Tafoya disappeared. This evidence was read aloud during the trial by Richard Brown, one of the lead investigators for the case, and probably the prosecution's star witness. On the day that Pamela was last seen, September 15, 1993, Joseph had written, Stayed in Yuba City all day long, took care of some old business. Not quite damning, but it showed that he was in the vicinity the entire day that she was likely killed. On Tafoya's last day alive, August 6, 1994, Naso wrote the following. Picked up a nice broad in Marysville, 4 p.m. She came over for four hours. Took photographs. Nice legs. She ripped me off. Again, it proved that Naso had been in the area, and this time, that he had been with a woman, and that he had ended with some kind of gripe against her. Tracy's sister had also said that she had been meeting up with somebody the day that she disappeared that was going to take photos of her. Richard Brown testified extensively about the myriad damning evidence against Joseph, speaking about the many disturbing photos, the journal, and the list written in Joseph's own handwriting. In a particularly heated exchange with Richard on cross-examination, Joseph claimed again that the photos were just his art, trying to debunk all of the evidence presented against him. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, Joseph tried again to make it seem like Brown had some sort of personal vendetta against him, demanding to know why Brown referred to one of his diaries as a rape journal. Brown replied matter-of-factly that it was because Joseph talked about things like having to rape women, raping them in alleyways and cars. Naso then claimed that this was just an expression, that he just meant it as in, you know, making out or something. The prosecution also called several convincing witnesses, including Richard Tafoya, Tracy's husband, who broke down crying before composing himself and identifying a photograph of his wife and some lingerie that she was wearing that they had purchased together shortly before her death. They also introduced evidence of the sexual assaults that Joseph had a pattern of committing, including against at least four women and even his ex-wife, Judith. When the prosecution finally rested, they felt that they had made a convincing case. Joseph Naso continued his defense in much the same fashion that he had started with, playing the persecuted victim himself. He showed the jurors other photographs he had taken, of weddings, landscapes, and portraits, as if to claim that he was a legitimate photographer, and calling the nudes of women glamour shots, and comparing himself to famous photographers at magazines like Playboy. In total, Naso called five witnesses, including a woman who had consensually modeled for him 
and had not died, and an artist that he wanted to help him legitimatize his work. Joseph himself never took the stand, though his voice was obviously prominent throughout the trial. Then it was time for closing statements. The prosecution claimed that Naso was a twisted man and a sexual predator who would drug his victims before photographing them, sexually assaulting them, and sometimes strangling them. Intent on keeping their humiliation going by immortalizing them in photographs and dumping his murdered victims completely naked, dehumanizing them at every turn. The prosecutors also reminded jurors of all of the evidence that pointed to Naso as a dangerous rapist and murderer that they could not risk letting back on the street. In the defense's closing arguments, Naso's arrogance is apparent, as is his high regard for himself and the low regard and level of respect he has toward women. Joseph mentioned again that all of his photographs were consensual, that they were his art. He also took the opportunity to brag about his supposed prowess, how he had a certain power of rapport over women. In one noteworthy line reported by CBS Sacramento, Naso apparently stared directly at prosecutors Ahana and Sloat, both women, as he said, I could probably get half the women in this room to disrobe voluntarily. The judge apparently scolded him after this display and ordered him to look at the judge when delivering these remarks. Joseph ultimately claimed that the entirety of the prosecution's case was a sham, that he had been set up, that the media was against him, that police had planted evidence, and that the DA only wanted to convict in order to curry favor with voters. But in the end, it appears as though Joseph should probably have taken the judge's advice. The jury found him unconvincing and found him guilty of murdering all four women. In the fall of 2013, the jury also recommended the death penalty. Upon hearing the verdict, Joseph shouted that this was a hate crime and proceeded to flick off all of the people watching in the courtroom. In determining whether or not to uphold the recommended sentence of death, Judge Andrew Sweet listened to family members testify. Despite the horrors that Joseph had wrought on their loved ones, there were many that didn't seem to get satisfaction at the thought of Naso being swiftly executed. Roxine Rogash's son said that Naso had robbed him of a childhood and a mother and told Naso directly that he hoped he lived to be 110 years old, presumably so that he could suffer in prison and feel the full weight of his crimes. Rachel Smith, who was one of Carmen's daughters, said the following, We lost the ability to have love from a mother. I don't want him to die. I want him to sit there alone. I want him to feel what it's like to lose everything. But despite these sentiments, Judge Sweet ultimately agreed with jurors and sentenced Naso to death for his crimes calling Joseph an evil and disturbed man who put his victims through unspeakable cruelty and humiliation that continued after their deaths. He also told Naso that the world was a worse place for him having existed. As of this recording in the summer of 2020, Joseph Naso is still alive and on death row in California. At the moment, Given that there is currently a moratorium on carrying out executions in the state of California, and also the fact that Joseph is currently 86 years old, it seems very unlikely that the state will ever be able to carry out that sentence, though Naso will certainly die in prison. But this case is far from over. Soon after his arrest, a task force was developed in Nevada to try to determine who his other victims might be, but so far, police have been unable to identify the other four women on Naso's list. In all likelihood, these women are other murder victims, their families still waiting for closure. They were listed by Naso as the following. Girl near Heldsburg, Mendocino County. Girl on Mount Tam. 
Girl from Miami, down near Peninsula, and Girl from Berkeley. This is not including the countless women that were likely sexually assaulted and exploited by NASO over the years, including women from places as far-flung as Cleveland, Kansas City, Wichita, and even London. And neither list is necessarily comprehensive. For all we know, NASO could have been in the middle of composing several lists, and the full extent of his crimes, and especially his murders, may never be known. Additionally, there are over 200 photos of as-yet unidentified women that were found at NASO's residence. In some of these photos, the women appear to be unconscious and in danger. Joseph Naso himself has shown absolutely no remorse for his crimes, continuing to pretend to be a victim himself. He has refused to admit any guilt, and it seems increasingly unlikely that he ever will. For those that are interested in helping out with this case, or who may recognize any of the descriptions on Naso's list, there's another podcast that featured this case called The Murder Squad. The hosts are a retired cold case investigator in California, Paul Holes, who many of you may know from his vital role in helping to solve the Golden State Killer case, and journalist Billy Jensen. The podcast is a very different style from this show, but one of their main purposes is to help crowdsource answers to long-forgotten cases using the public's help. They covered Naso's case in 2019, and fun fact... Paul Holes was actually one of the investigators that helped link Carmen Colon's murder to Joseph Naso. It's definitely worth listening to their take on the case and speculation about the extent of Joseph's crimes. But for anybody that is interested in taking a look at some of the photos of unidentified women, or who may have an idea who some of these missing women might be, their website provides an excellent resource and even includes still images of Naso's list and entries from his diary, written by hand. They also have resources for reporting any leads. The website URL for that page is very long, but you can find it in their Season 1 archives. It's Episode 10, and their website is just themurdersquad.com. We'll also have a link to the page from our website, along with some other photos from the case and all of the resources we used at crimeandsacrifice.com. As for me, this was definitely a disturbing case to stumble across. After researching Joseph Naso in detail, I don't actually believe that Joseph was the alphabet killer from Rochester, but I'm not sure that's any consolation, as it's just as horrifying to imagine that he was inspired by that case, that he did, in fact, stalk at least four of his victims and kill them, possibly because he was inspired by a case that has cast such a shadow over Rochester for all these years, that he specifically targeted a woman simply because she had the same name as Carmen Cologne in Rochester. It's just so arbitrary and awful, demonstrating the depths that some people can fall to, living such fractured, separated, and disgusting lives where other people have no meaning to them, where the women he encountered probably came to mean as much as the mannequins he kept around his house. It's difficult to think about how many years Joseph was able to operate, to contemplate how many lives he may have devastated. But I do truly believe that people who have engaged in acts as evil as Joseph has, that their everyday lives are filled with delusion, paranoia, suffering, and separation, without access to true human connection and joy. I believe Joseph constructed his own personal hell that he has been stuck in for some time, possibly most of his life. It's just unfortunate that he had the opportunity to drag other people into it. But it's not as if committing these kinds of crimes don't have a price, even when it's not exacted by law enforcement. I am very glad that Joseph is currently locked up, that he was captured and exposed for the person he really is while he was still alive, that some families have had closure 
and I hope that the rest of the people who have been impacted by him find that same closure, that his other victims will be found. That's our show for this week. Be sure to rate and review if you haven't done so already, if you want to help us out. We're very much looking forward to bringing a story of hope this coming Monday. Thank you so much for listening to Crime and Sacrifice. What kind of person will you choose to be?